All right, on today's episode, I welcome on a very, very special guest. He is the ESPN National Recruiting Director for High School Boys Basketball and was recently named one of the 100 most influential people in men's college basketball in 2020. He is Paul Bean, uh, by, oh my God, uh, Biancardi. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right, buddy. I'm a New England guy, so I've, I've been called worse. <laughs> well, Paul, I can't thank you enough for uh, being on the show. How, how are you doing with everything? It's great. Uh, college and high school basketball season ended and you get right into the grassroots scene. You get right into the NBA draft, you know, recruiting and, and basketball. Really, it's, it's 12 months a year. Yeah, yeah. It's nonstop. High. And you're working with the draft right now. We talked a little bit off air. How is that going? Good. I just try to supply information to teams that have questions about the prospects they're looking at because I get a chance to lay my eyes on these kids at an early age, right? Freshman, sophomore in high school, not only watch them play, but get to know them as people, get to know the circle that they uh, stand around. And um, you, you get a really unique perspective of basketball and character and academics. I like to call it, you know, character, academics, and talent, the cat. I get to know a lot about the cat, about each player. That's, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, you, you watch a lot of kids from, uh, you know, you get to watch them grow up pretty much in front of your eyes and then see them go into college basketball and then as well as uh, now working in the NBA draft and watching these young men get, go through that process as well, too. That's, that's really cool that you're a part of, like, it seems like every stage of, uh, you know, from high school to college. I am, you know, from high school the transition to college and then to the NBA. And not only do I help the teams uh, try to get the most accurate information, I'm also trying to help the players that are thinking about going into the draft. If they want an unbiased opinion uh, about where they stand and what they need to work on them, I'm always good for a truthful evaluation. And I think it can really help those guys decide what they need to work on in the off season. And, you know, what's the best fit from high school to college and then from college to the NBA you know, should they come back to school? What options should they weigh? I, I just like to be everybody's uncle. I love it. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it's great. I'm sure it's great. The kids must appreciate that too. I'm sure to, you know, receive that advice from you and, uh, you know, and be truthful about it because some people could lie about things and it's great. And I like that the uncle be everybody's uncle and everything like that. <laughs> um, but coach, I, I want to jump into your coaching career because everything that you worked for here today is, you know, you worked really hard. I mean, you started from the, like a, a coaching career, like you started like at the lower level and worked your way up, um, obviously. But I want to ask something before we jump into the coaching career too, is you, your playing career, you started at Salem State, State and uh, you played for Coach Tom Thibodeau, who is now the coach of the Knicks. Like, you know, what was your experience uh, playing for Coach Tom Thibodeau back in the day? It was, it was great. It was everything that I was looking for. Uh, actually, I went to walk on at Salem State and Tibbs was a senior that year. I was a freshman. I got cut as a freshman. So life doesn't get worse, right? You're a cut walk on. <laughs> but my goal and my dream was to play. So I went back the second year and I got injured in tryouts. I broke my ankle. So in the third year, I went back. Tibbs now is an assistant on the team and I made the team. You know, I made the roster, never played practice player walk on. But I loved it. I had the uniform and I was part of something I always wanted to be part of, a college basketball team. Uh, then the next year was my fourth year. And then I got a year back because I broke my ankle, which was my fifth year. Tibbs was the head coach that senior year of mine. Uh, he named me captain with two other guys, Dave Fazio and Nate Bryant. Those guys were the stars of the team. But I got to be named captain because of you know, the intangibles and the traits that I brought to the practice, to the locker room and to the game. And, you know, it's one honor that, you know, I'll never forget because I didn't get it based on my talent or my name. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome that you were able to, I mean, the hard work that you did and obviously you bring up the intangibles and like to mention those intangibles before we jump into the coach career, do you look for that in the kids that you, uh, you scout now and everything? All the time, every single coaching stop that I've had. And today, I mean, I have a mental checklist of traits that I look for, but for me, Number one was persistency. Obviously, I had it because I kept trying out until I made the team. So, you know, that, that's probably my greatest trait is that, you know, the persistence to never stop, to keep going. And uh, that, that helped me, you know, be on the team. Intensity, um, that, that's a big thing. I brought intensity to practice. Again, 
not talented, average at best, but I brought a good intensity level to the practice. And I brought it to, you know, most practices. I, I would call myself an everyday, everyday guy that I was, you know, looking forward to practice. Because for me, practice was the game anyway. Um, but, you know, I loved everything about the sport, watching film, training in the off season, the practices, the individual workouts without trainers. That's right. I said without trainers, we did it on our own or with our teammates. And um, so I look for intensity. I look for persistency. I look for guys that are coachable. I was extremely coachable and I could coach others on the team. And so that made me a great teammate. And that's something else I look for in players. I tell everybody today is be the teammate that you want to have. Everybody wants to have great friends and great teammates. That, that's true, right? But yeah. you've got to try to be that teammate and be that friend. And uh, you usually find it coming back to you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. And that's great that you're able to, you've experienced it and then you're able to bring it to your career now. And uh, it's funny that you bring up the no trainers. I feel like now everyone has a trainer and everyone works out with someone at different, different times for sure, huh? <laughs> And I think trainers are great. I think they yeah. serve a really good purpose. Um, I say that because, you know, the assistant coach on a staff was the trainer. Usually the assistant coach would work you out. The assistant coach was well-groomed in teaching the game of basketball and the fundamentals of footwork, passing, catching, ball handling, you know, studying film. And then when I was a coach for over 20 years, I, I felt like I was the trainer. But I understand they specialize in helping kids. And, and some trainers are very, very good, and some have a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I can see that. I've witnessed that. Um, but what made you want to get into the coaching after your basketball career was over, you know, playing at the, you know, the, at the basketball at college? So what, what was the decision to get into coaching? I grew up in Boston in the inner city called East Boston. Mm -hmm. And as you know, being in Rhode Island, you know, far from Boston. So I played baseball, played football, played street hockey. That was a big sport growing up, you know, with the orange ball. Yeah. And, um, but the last sport I played was basketball and really about 13 years old, I started playing and, and that was pretty old to start, you know, playing a sport. I played all the other sports, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. And I just had a love affair with basketball. And when, when I went to high school, I went to Pope John in Everett, Massachusetts. It's now closed. Uh, I fell in love with the game so much that I knew that I wanted a coach. I tried to help my coaches coach. And when I wasn't playing high school basketball during the season, I would go back to my local church called St. Lazarus and I would help help coach that team. Uh, so I really started coaching when I was in high school. I was coaching CYO basketball. Oh, wow. That's that's crazy. And then it how is. did you how did you get into the college level? I mean, I know your first job was uh, the Vision one job was at BC, but you started at Salem State, right? Yeah, I, I had a path that just like my playing career, but thank God my coaching career was better than my playing career. <laughs> <laughs> but I started at the bottom. I, I played for Tibbs. And after my senior year, Tibbs went to Harvard as an assistant and I wanted to get into coaching. So I, I got to stay on staff at, at Salem State and a great coach who was a tremendous player by the name of Dana Skinner. Uh, he's from the Merrimack Valley area in Massachusetts. Uh, he was the head coach. I got to join him and I don't even remember if I got paid or not, but I, I was so excited. I was so happy. And uh, just to learn from him uh, things about coaching and, and learning from Tibbs and trying to put it all together. And then after that, as a division three assistant, um, I had to figure out, you know, what can I do to survive financially? So I, I just did odd jobs to make money that year. And then the following year, I was the JV coach at Stoneham High School. I want to try the high school level, as we yeah. talked about off air. And I worked for Billy Killalay. Billy Killalay's father, John Killalay, was a longtime assistant with the Celtics. In fact, he was the right-hand man for Tommy Heinsohn and all those glory years for the Celtics. So I got to work with Billy. Billy was the, the head coach varsity at Stoneham High School. I was his JV coach. Great experience. That After that, I said, you know what? I, I like the college level better. So – then I picked up a job at Suffolk University with Jim Nelson, who was the longtime coach and athletic director, and he's in the Hall of Fame at Suffolk. Worked there for three years, trying to get to the jump like most coaches do from Division Three to Division Two or to Division One. Well, I, I just kind of sent my resume everywhere back then, and uh, I got an interview with Mike Jarvis at Boston University, and he had no spots available 
of the spot that I went for, which was the, um, the sorry about that. The ah, spot no that I went, the spot that I went for was the uh, part-time position. Did not get it. Andy Greer got it. Andy Greer now works for Tibbs with the Knicks. So it's a great story. So Jarvis says, well, I don't have anything left on my staff, but I'll give you the volunteer position. And he says, you, you can take that. And uh, that's all I have. So I said, how much does it pay? <laughs> I didn't say that. And I said, coach, I would love to be a volunteer here at BU. I says, you know, how can we make that happen? He told me, you know, the job description. I told him I could do it. So then I jumped from Suffolk to Boston University. Big jump. That's yeah. a big jump, as you know. You go from Division Three to Division One, But not getting any money, and I'm getting older, you know, I needed to make some money. So I was a substitute teacher during the day in the Boston Public Schools, and then I would drive over to BU for practice, and I'd be there on the weekends for games or scouting reports. Um, I did everything as a volunteer. I mean, I would get laundry for the coaches. I would sweep the floors. I'd go get food. I'd be involved in watching film. You know, it, it was a great job because I learned the profession from some really good coaches. Uh, Billy Herrian, who now is the head coach at New Hampshire. Carl Hobbs, who's an assistant coach at uh, Rutgers right now. And Andy Greer, who's in the NBA with Tibbs. So we had a great staff. And, and Mike Jarvis was a phenomenal coach at Boston University, George Washington, and St. John. So very fortunate to get a volunteer position. I don't know if a lot of guys would do that today in their mid-20s and sacrifice like that. I say that because everybody wants to get paid for what they do. And, and, and that's normal and that's natural. But if you're going to climb in the coaching profession, the last thing you're asking about and the last thing you, you think about is the money. Yeah. And, and then I went from Boston University. Uh, now I'm 28 years old, 27 years old. And I become the grad assistant at Boston College. That means I, I, I make $2,000 for the year. I go to school full time and I work. 50, 60 hours a week as a graduate assistant. Had to live at home. I couldn't even supplement my income because they needed me there. That was the job description, you know, full time. So I'm full time making 2000, taking classes and living at home. But I never thought about how poor I was. And I grew up pretty poor. You know, we were on welfare for a while as a young oh, wow. kid. I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, my mom and dad split up when I was seven. And uh, we went through some really lean years um, when I was young, but I never had money in the forefront of my mind. I just had coaching basketball and, and being a college coach. And once I got that graduate assistant at BC, uh, the year after that, a couple of spots opened up and I was promoted. And then the rest of my career, you know, you, you pretty much know about, we talked about Boston College, Ohio State, the head coach at Wright State. And then I was at St. Louis uh, with the late, great Rick Majerus, who was a fabulous I thought he was going towards the Hall of Fame as a head coach someday. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, your journey, like you said, like the volunteering and then taking the grad assistant job, and it's obviously a huge grind. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, I think when people see coaching, it's it's all glamour and glitz. You think you're making all the money and everything. But, you know, the grind that you put into it, was there any any thought in your mind when you were coaching, like, that you wanted to stop this? Or did you just say, like, just keep going, keep going, keep going, you know? Yeah, that number one trait, persistency, I told you about. No, never thought about stopping. Never thought about how much money I was making or not making. I can tell you this. I remember this. When I was a grad assistant at BC, I'm 28 years old. Okay, I'm in the hole for about 15 grand in credit cards. Cool. I'm making two grand. There's no, And I have no upside to make any money because I have to do this graduate assistant job. And who knew that I was going to get promoted from within? Uh, it just happened to be some spots available. And the head coach at the time, Jim O'Brien, obviously, you know, liked my work, liked my loyalty and, and knew he could trust me and had a chance to get elevated um, to one of the full time positions. But I didn't know that was going to happen. The graduate assistant position could have led me to, you know, anything. It led me in house. So I, I started at the bottom at every level and I just worked my way up. And sometimes you have to have a lot of patience and a lot of persistency to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not, it doesn't come overnight, I guess. It's like, it's like, like I think we talked about this too, a little bit. it's like, it doesn't come overnight. It's like Rome wasn't built in a day type of like yeah. thing. You have to like work extremely hard to be uh, a basketball coach. I know even being at the high school level, 
it's a lot of hours like and you don't get paid a lot either it's like you put in you have to you you're not just a coach as well at the high school of your uh you know you're you're a teacher you're uh, a therapist so that sometimes you help kids out you guide them <laughs> in the right way like you know it's just it's a, a lot that goes on at, at all levels it, it really is and I was a division one assistant for 14 years before I became a head coach and you're still not ready for a head coaching position in college even after 14 years I mean I was ready but there were things that I wasn't good at and there were things that I learned a lot on the job so no matter how many hours you put in you know the game changes the profession changes and you've got to stay up to date with it. And, you know, there's recruiting, there's scouting, there's practice, there's game management, there's roster management, there's academics, weights and conditioning. I mean, when you're the head coach, I mean, you're in charge of the entire program. And today it's as complicated as ever with the portal, uh, with COVID eligibility, and now with name, image, and likeness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. I like, just like that stuff that just happened with Saban and uh, Jimbo Fisher with the NIL stuff, yeah. like going out of yeah. that. Oh my God! That's yeah, I, I, that, they could have did that, you know, over the phone or on Zoom. They didn't have to bring it to public places. It's like, yeah, it's not. That's not a good place to how to handle it and everything. And it, yeah, but it's it's crazy. It, it is a different. It's a way different time, especially with the NIL and the tier um, uh, recruiting and everything like that. But I mean. What did you learn on a coach Jim O'Brien? I mean, you coached with him at BC and you also followed him to Ohio State. What were some of the things that you learned coaching underneath him and learning from him? Yeah, he was also the, you know, when you look at his career, he was the Atlantic 10 coach of the year at St. Bonaventure. He was the Big East coach of the year at Boston College. And he was the Big Ten coach of the year at Ohio State. Uh, this guy could really coach the game from a strategic standpoint. I learned a lot about schemes. I learned a lot about strategy. He was a terrific offensive-minded coach. Uh, you heard the phrase baseline drive, baseline drift, and one more. What we were doing that in the 90s. Uh, oh, wow. Long before teams were doing it, we played a three-guard offense in the 90s when most teams played wow. a traditional two-guard, small forward, and two bigs. Um, he did a lot of things from a defensive standpoint that just really confused teams. Uh, he was an excellent game coach, and, and he really handled the players in a fair an equitable way. And uh, I learned a lot from him as a basketball coach. That's awesome. That's great. And you were in the big East at the time at BC. Um, oh, big East was a killer. Alonzo yeah. morning, Allen Iverson, George Thompson, uh, John Thompson. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, Roly Massimino, Jim Calhoun, Ray yeah. Allen, Rip Hamilton. I mean, we, we had pros on every team. We had a couple of good players too. We had Billy Curley and How Howard Isley, uh, two guys that, you know, got drafted in the NBA. Howard played for a long time. Billy was a first round pick and brought us to the um, final four. I'm sorry, to the elite eight yeah. in 1994. We beat North Carolina and Indiana in the same week in 94. Wow. It was the best week ever for Boston College basketball. And then at Ohio State, I coached some great players with Scooney Penn, who was a transfer from Boston College, and Michael Red, uh, one of the richest second round draft picks ever <laughs> in the NBA. I think he made over $90 million and he was a second round pick. He was a great player for the Bucks back when he I was. think it was like, wasn't Ray Allen. He got, he filled in for Ray Allen. Ray, Ray Allen got hurt and he just like exploded on the scene. Yeah. He left early when leaving early was not the thing to do. Uh, yeah. He left after his junior year. He really bet on himself. And I think he has a podcast now, Mike Red, called bet on yourself. Uh, <laughs> tremendous worker, just like Scooney Penn. Scooney was a, an elite worker and leader, as was Billy Curley and Howard Isley. We also had Malcolm Huckabee at Boston College, a, a great player for us. So we, we had enormous success at BC uh, and then at Ohio State. And one other guy I got to mention was uh, Danier Abrams. In the Big East, he was 6'7", uh, close to 260, and he destroyed people inside. And he was part of the uh, Big East championship we won. So I, I'm very fortunate to be with, with Mike Jarvis, Jim O'Brien, and then the late, great Rick Majerus. I love it. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. You get to coach with some, some great coaches and uh, you know, a, a couple more questions about your coach career and then we'll jump over to the ESPN information as well too. Um, when you do recruiting for the big East and the big 10, was there a different type of players that you'd recruit? Cause I feel like there's two different styles of plays in those conferences. What, what would you like kind of players would you switch to and look for? Yeah, back in the mid to late 90s and the early 2000s, the Big East was a dribble drive league, if you will. You know, inner city New York, Detroit, 
Atlanta, Boston guys, New Jersey guys that just beat you off the bounce. And they just attacked and attacked and attacked. That's how Georgetown was. That's how Connecticut was. Syracuse was that way. Um, the, the great players back then were not as great shooters. There were some shooters sprinkled in, but it was, you know, guys that could attack you off the bounce. So we were looking for guards who can break you down one-on-one. -on -one. And then obviously it was hard to get bigs that were really good uh, because everybody wanted them. And back then the big man was utilized inside much more than it is today. So um, the guards break you down off the dribble and the big guys, if you can find a big guy who could just, you know, post up and drop step. You were doing good. Uh, you're doing well uh, in the Big East. Those those guys were monsters. I mean, the guys that didn't make the NBA in the Big East uh, went overseas and made a lot of money. They were physically imposing men at, at that time uh, in the 90s in the Big East. And every night you're on, you know, Big Monday or a, a game on Saturday on ESPN. And it was just, it was the most in, intense thing I've ever been through was the Big East. Now, the Big Ten was great, but the Big East just had an intensity level that you felt like there was going to be a fight. You know, yeah. during the game, um, <laughs> but there wasn't. And the Big Ten, you know, more Midwest uh, recruiting. You, you want to recruit your base, which was the state of Ohio, because kids grew up wanting to play at Ohio State. So you had to seek out the right ones and try to bring them in. Shooters were a big thing. Um, you know, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Michigan State, uh, programs like that, really, Purdue, Gene Cady, Bob Knight, uh, guys that really thrived on guys who could make shots. So we switched a little bit more to the shooter in, at Ohio State, but we still like those guys who could beat you off the bounce. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And then, I, and then you mentioned the big men. I feel like all the big men back in the day, like they went for the Big East. They all went to Georgetown. Like all the greats came out of uh, Georgetown. It was like Morning and uh, Ewing and all those guys came out, of, came out of there. Yeah, how about playing against, how about playing against Dikembe Mutombo yeah, and Alonzo yeah. Morning in the, in the same game? Oh my God. There, there was no room in the paint for anybody else. <laughs> it, it was, they, they were massive. I mean, they were pros before they were pros. They had Othello Harrington, who was, who was big, huge, physically imposing guy played in the NBA. Yep. You have to get your hot Jahidi white was six ten two eighty. 280. Um, and back then, I mean, you know, there wasn't foul unless there was blood coming out of your skin. <laughs> yeah. It, it was crazy. Those were like, I, I vaguely remember I'm, I'm in my thirties, but I do remember like those, like, matchups and then like when you look back at like those guys where they played at college you're like i didn't realize that like matumbo and morning played together in the same team at georgetown Ooh. it was crazy there's no scouting report for those two guys you just got to hope and pray that they would miss <laughs> their best shot though was a miss but they were the best offensive rebounding team in the conference i mean all we did was work on blockouts and breaking pressure when you play georgetown there's no schemes there's no strategy you just got to make sure you don't turn it over and you got to block them out and we did a pretty good job against them when Curly, Isley, Huckabee, and other guys got older. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 crazy. I mean, I'm sure you had to throw some high uh, floors over those guys to get some at least get some shots off in the lane. <laughs> um, and then, so you also played at right. I mean, you coached at Wright State, and you won Coach of the Year in the Horizon League. I mean, what was that feeling like for yourself taking over a program and winning that Coach of the Year? You know, when you're a head coach, especially for the first time, you're, you're so consumed with your job. And I, I really didn't even think about it, didn't even know when the award was coming out. In fact, I was coming off the bus and my SID pulled me to the side and had a piece of paper. And he said, you got coach of the year and Bernard Harlan's got, you know, all conference and Seth Dalibo made all conference and Deshaun Wood was the freshman of the year. And those are the guys on my team. I was like, wow, that's great. Okay, what time is practice? Uh, <laughs> you, you, you just don't, you don't bask in the glory of it at the time. You just keep going to the next thing. But I, I was so many great coaches in that conference at the time. Butler was the king, right? Butler was great when they were in the Horizon League. Yeah. And uh, then you had Bruce Pearl at Milwaukee. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. He, yeah, he was, he was really hard to, to beat. In fact, I never beat him. Uh, so <laughs> I was 0-6 against Bruce. And, uh, you know, Cleveland State. You know, Green Bay, Youngstown State, Detroit was always good because they got the transfers from Michigan State and Michigan, and uh, they were really hard to play against. So it was a great conference. Uh, it's, it's a pure basketball conference. There's no football. And uh, I, I really enjoyed my time there. And I did recruit one of the best players that ever played at Wright State. He got the player of the year in the conference, Deshaun Wood. Uh, the same player I told you about was freshman of the year, became a senior uh, player of the year when he was a senior. Wow, that's crazy. That's awesome that you were 
able to bring him into the program. Yeah, he was my first recruit. And uh, because we did so much up in Ohio, uh, Michigan, at Ohio State, and at Boston College, I did a lot up in Michigan. So I knew the lay of the land up there well, and he was still unsigned in the springtime. And I was really fortunate to have some friends who told me about him. And as soon as I saw him, I fell in love with him. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great that you were able to bring him in and uh, uh, do that and have one of the best players uh, in the Horizon League and for Wright State. Yeah, it was a great feeling. And, you know, he, he led Wright State to a lot of wins. And uh, when I was gone, he led them to the NCAA championship. So uh, he's a Hall of Famer for Wright State. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Um, so when did you start to make the transition over to ESPN? What was that? When, I know you did like some stuff, but like when did that actually happen? Um, I was coaching in St. Louis with Rick Majerus, and he was starting the program over again. Uh, on the staff was Porter Moser, who now is the head coach at Oklahoma. And so Porter and I were assistants there with uh, a couple other guys and um, trying to help coach build up St. Louis in the Atlantic 10. And after one year, the position at ESPN was created. Uh, they were looking for people. And uh, a friend of mine, who was a college teammate at Salem State, uh, knew the person who was doing the hiring at ESPN and, and put me together with him to see if I had any interest. And I had no interest because coaching was what I wanted to do, and it was the love. And uh, so we talked about the job, uh, gave him some names. And then a couple of weeks later, he called back and kind of wanted to hire me. And wow. so they made me a pretty good offer. So I decided to take it. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, how, what was it like to come into that role and like, you know, create what, what the ESPN recruiting, like, you know, the website and, you know, bring, bring that all eyes to like uh, high school basketball. Yeah, it was unique. They started it in football and then carried over to basketball. And it, it's always great when you can create something from the ground up. It, you know, we didn't know what we were going to do at first. We had a plan. Uh, but then it really took off um, ranking of the players, the evaluation, of the players telling the country who the best players are, why they're the best, where they're going to go to school. Um, it, and it really caught on fire because, as you know, recruiting is everything in college sports. And so so the model um, in football and basketball has, has been tremendous. And, you know, I feel like we've done a, a really, really good job in that space. Yeah, that that's awesome. That, I mean, it's it's all over. I mean, it's, it's so cool to like, like go like right now and just look up in 2023, you know, uh, ESPN national recruits and like see the list, you see the stars, the rankings and everything like that. Do uh, people ever give you like flack for the rankings and everything? Every day, <laughs> every single day there's criticism and that's good. That means they're looking at it. Um, and we, we also rank guys, you know, juniors, and sophomores, and then we have a database list of, of top 50 by position. So we, we really look at, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids. And then we evaluate a 250 by position, 50 in each position. And then we rank only 100. We also have a lot of TV games, as you notice. You know, Geico Nationals is the championship we have. We have high school games during the season. You know, and I'm involved with the McDonald's All-American game, uh, the Nate Smith uh, Player of the Year. Uh, Gatorade committee for, you know, the Gatorade award, but high school basketball has really blossomed. I think we, we televised in close to 30 or 40 games last year. Wow. So it, it's something that's uh, only getting bigger because, you know, the, the game is so important at that level because those guys are going to the college game and, and to be stars or role players. And then some of them are going to be, you know, NBA lottery picks and first round picks. And that's why, you know, the high school game is, is, is really, I, th I think, is as strong as ever. Now, a lot of people don't like, you know, kids being ranked young and kids being on TV young. And I get that as a coach. I really do. But long before I was coaching, people were ranking players. Uh, they've been ranking teams forever. And uh, so we started to put the games on, on TV because people wanted to see these high school players. Uh, so I think it's here to stay. Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel like the high school level of basketball has. I mean, I graduated high school back in '06, and it's it's grown. I mean, besides seeing LeBron James on TV, uh, like you know, a few games when he was you know coming out, but I feel like it's grown so much that like you turn on TV, you're, you're watching a game, and 
you know, obviously it's great that you, you get, you created this and get to be a part of it and the high school national championships and everything and seeing the IMGs and the Mont Verdes and those guys play against each other. I mean, what's it like to see those guys battle and the Sunrise Christian Academies and like the Link Academies and all those guys go at each other? Yeah, it's been great. In fact, there's, there was a new conference put together called the NIBC and it puts together Mont Verde, IMG, Oak Hill, um, you know, different schools of, of that level, La Lumiere out of Indiana and uh, Link Academy uh, should be in that conference. Eventually I know Arizona Compass Prep is in it. So that those are really some of the top high school teams in the country and they all have excellent coaches. You know, Sunrise Christian, you mentioned, and he got coach of the year. Montford, Kevin Boyle, has gotten coach of the year. And Steve Smith has been coach of the year at Oak Hill. He just retired. Sean McAloon, excellent coach down at IMG. So, there's high level players with, with great schools. I mean, these are real schools, brick and mortar schools uh, with good resources for basketball and, and excellent leadership. So it's a lot of fun because it's really like being in the big East or the big 10 back in college. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's like, I watched the Mont Verde versus IMG game in the Geico national championships. And that was like, it was intense. You can feel the intensity just like sitting there watch, watching that game. And that it's great that they created this conference as well too. What's it like to kind of see these different high schools emerge, uh, like, you know, come up into the high school scene and like with their, with the top prep schools and now being like getting great players. I mean, it used to be the old Oak Hill used to be like the big, big name back yeah. in the day. And now it's like Mont Verde AMG. Yeah. Well, even before Oak Hill or, or at the same time as Oak Hill, you had the prep schools up in your country, New England. Yeah. MCI, Brewster Academy, Bridgeton Academy. Uh, Worcester Academy. And those are fabulous places for kids to go to school. Uh, Northfield, Mount Hermon. You get the, the balance of the academics and the basketball. And I still think that NEPSAC is, is maybe the single best uh, conference in the country, postgraduate conference in the country. I do think the NIBC is the best you know, high school conference in the country. You also have the Washington Catholic Athletic Conference in D.C. with DeMatha, Bishop O'Connell, Gonzaga. So there's some really strong basketball conferences all around the country. And to see this emerge is exciting. The talent is spreading out across America. And uh, I really feel fortunate to get to evaluate these guys, interview them, get to know them as people and build a, a genuine relationship with them and their families. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And it's great that you do this. And it's so great how like you have helped grown the high school game of basketball and to see where it is today. And, you get to see these kids from, like we talked about, from you see them at the high school level, to move to college, then to go on to pros. And that's awesome that you're pretty much been like a part of their lives for, you know, for a good chunk of it. <laughs> yeah, usually with the guys that, you know, can't keep in touch with everyone. And some guys, unfortunately, weren't happy with their ranking uh, coming out of high school. So I try to have a real relationship with everyone, not a ranking relationship. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's a good thing. Hopefully, yeah, I, I can understand that people get mad, but it's it's part of it. But obviously, guys go on. There's some potential they just don't see, or some programs work out better for them. That's right. That's awesome. But I, coach, I, I want to get into just some players that up in the Nepsack area, and some guys I've had on on the show. There's some guys from the, you know, from the 2023 class that I know. Um, we'll start with the Sunrise uh, Academy Laden Bait uh, Blocker. You know, you ranked him 28th. I mean, what what about this kid? I love this kid. He's a, he was a sixth man on this team, and now we, now he's doing everything. Uh, you know, really going to be the guy on the team next year. Yeah, he's really uh, played his role very well at Sunrise Christian. I love his open court speed uh, with the basketball. He he controls the ball uh, with the push dribble in the open floor. He can set up his team in the half court. He can break you down one-on-one -on -one off the bounce. And, and today's game, getting into the paint and kicking it out is a big part of the game, and he does that at a high level. A good shooter, good shooter from the outside. So he continues to learn how to you know, balance the shot and the drive, as well as being a point guard uh, in terms of a mental approach, understanding the nuances, you know, the offense to run, where guys are supposed to be, find the hot hand, uh, and still get his points. But – He's a guy that I expect to have a, a big off season and a big high school season this year. Yeah. Yeah. He had a big uh, UIBL session recently too. And, uh, you know, playing for Brad Beal elite and yeah. got, got a lot of notes that during that time. Yeah. He, 
He's one of the premier point guards uh, in the class because he combines physical speed, uh, quickness, uh, scoring ability, and the ability to make the assist. And he's a willing passer. Just got to learn how to read the game more and slow down a little bit. Uh, but he, he's one of the best we have in, in, in the league. That's awesome. That's great. And then now we'll bring it up to the Napsack area. Uh, we have Gavin Griffiths. Uh, he's ranked 26. Yeah. He's in Kings Oxford. I love this kid. He's such a nice kid as well, too. And, uh, yeah. you know, what, what's it like? What, what about him? Oh, shooter, range, deep. Uh, I love I love his size and the ability to catch it, release it quick. He's got great mechanics, good preparation, uh, range and accuracy. His, his three ball is deep. And then if they close out hard, he puts it on the deck and he can finish. He scores, he shoots it with great size. Really like him. Yeah, and then and then go on to the Taylor Bobo and rank fiftieth, and uh, you know, great great kid as well too, and long kid, and then plays for Brewster yeah. Academy. <laughs> and he plays for our our guy Jason uh, Jason Smith at Brewster Academy, who's been up there forever. And you talk about high school coaches that have put guys into college and at the next level. Uh, what I love about Jason is he holds his kids accountable, and he's demanding without being demeaning. I just had to give him that little plug because. Uh, been to his practices, been to his games, and you know, he's a no-nonsense coach, but he gives his kids a lot of love and care at the same time. And that's why his guys do so well, or they don't last there. Yeah. Uh, but the young man we're talking about, Taylor, is, you know, he just, he plays with joy, right? He's got a smile on his face half the time. <laughs> yeah. He's 6'6". He's really athletic, and I think he can be a, an excellent defender. He's a good finisher right now, great in transition. And, and as he continues to slow down, See, a lot of these guys play so fast that they have to learn how to think slow but play fast. And I think what happens is their mind is going fast, their body's going fast, and sometimes they get out of control. So as he continues to learn the game and the speed of the game, slowing down but still playing fast, um, you know, he can be one of the best players in the country. He's that good. Yeah, wow. And then how about his teammate, Mateus? Um, you know, he was also oh, yeah. with Bruce, Bruce Day. He's the 11th. He's a yeah, he's he's a tear above. You know, <laughs> the guy, the guys we're talking about. I mean, this guy's a six nine wing guard. Yeah, great pass, great passer. I mean, he can see the pass as soon as the ball hits his hands. He knows exactly where it's going. He's got vision. He's got he's got willingness to give it up. He's got the accuracy to hit a guy in stride for a layup or you know backdoor cut or hit a guy coming off a screen. He can certainly score the ball with skill. He's got a power forward size frame. You know, he's not strong like a power forward, but he's got the height of a power forward and, and he's got the, the skills of a guard. He's just got to play with a little bit more, you know, everyday intensity. And I think that's a big part of his game that's missing. I love it. I love it. And then uh, uh, how about uh, Yugon Kingsley from uh, Putnam Science? You know, I saw a lot of recruits looking at him that, uh, when I was at the um, National Prep School Invitational down at Rick. Uh, sort of, there's a lot of people looking at him. Yeah, big seven foot shot blocker. I mean, that's what he does. He yeah. he protects the rim and he finishes <laughs> inside. He, he's a presence on both ends, but the presence is in the paint and at the rim. And uh, I know a lot of schools are very high on him because you know he bring, brings things you can't coach. It's not just the size, but the ability to to block a shot. So on the defensive end, that's that's the way you start the fast break. Uh, you know, he's got a little Nerlens Noel in him. If you oh. remember that name from Boston, yeah. Yep. Um, one of the best paint shot blockers, meaning that Nerlens could really block shots in the paint. He didn't go outside the paint much, Nerlens. You know, some guys like Anthony Davis would roam outside the paint, Willie Cauley Stein. Uh, this big guy can really, really block shots, protect, uh, contest shots, and then finish down the other end. I love it. I love it. And then the last guy, he's a Rhode Island guy, um, uh, Isaiah Miranda. You know, yeah. like, he started playing basketball re like, freshman year and really got into it sophomore year. So what, what about him? Just gifted, really gifted. I mean, he doesn't realize how good he can be. He's got skill. He's got mobility. And he's got the length to block shots and rebound with inside with, with, with long frame. And he can score with touch. He, he can step out and shoot it. So there's a lot of things he can do. Uh, he's got to go from now a, you know, a prospect to a player. Right. He's got to go from a guy who shows flashes to a guy who's more consistent. And, uh, you know, it all starts with his habits, his daily habits. You know, what he does on a daily basis will decide what type of player he'll be in the long run. That's great. That's great. Well, coach, this is awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, coming on the show and, you know, breaking down some players that 
are from the New England area that are in in your your top rankings. And uh, you know, obviously, Layden, who's been uh, on the show as well too, and you know, great career ahead of him as well. Um, I just have one last question for you before we wrap everything up. I got to know. You seem like a busy guy. You're all you're at NBA doing the NBA stuff. You're doing the, the high school AU season, uh, college basketball. Uh, what do you do outside of basketball? What's your favorite thing to do outside of basketball? <laughs> <laughs> Be with my wife. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good that's a good answer. Yeah, she comes first though. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's definitely a good answer. <laughs> but but I'll give you a good good sidebar story. When I was at GA Boston College. She was the head coach of the women's team for soccer. Really? Yeah. So she's the head women's soccer coach at Boston College, and I'm the lowly GA. Um, we were the only two single people in the department, so we started to, you know, talk, date, and then we got married right on BC's campus, and and we had our first first child right at, right in Boston at Boston College. So uh, BC will always be a special place, and. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great story. So not only was I the GA, but I also, you know, found a wife there. Oh my god, that's awesome. That's that's a great story. Does your wife still coach? She does. She coached she she coached at Boston College, and then when we moved to Ohio, obviously, you know, she had to give up her job, which was a big sacrifice on her end. Um, but she coached high school, Bishop Watterson High School in Columbus, Ohio, uh, and then uh, now in North Carolina. That's where we live now. She coaches the Charlotte soccer academy the youth uh high level soccer academy 12 year old 12 and under so she can't give it up either ah that's understandable i think when you have that first love of a sport that you fall in love with at a young age you can't can't let it go it's tough to let go yeah so and really other than that i mean at, at this stage of my life you know your, your family is the most important thing it always should be and sometimes it took a back seat um when you're younger in your profession and then uh, basketball and family, those, those are the two top things. I love it, Coach. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and, you know, talking about your career and the grind that you put into, obviously, to be where you are today to, you know, it's you're exceptional. You do a great job and, uh, you know, love seeing you on TV and you've been made such an impact on the high school level. And I can't wait to see what's down the line for sure and more down that league. And uh, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And keep up the great work yourself. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, coach. Well, have a good one. And uh, hopefully you can get some, uh, get some rest. <laughs>